you guys will get a QR code. This is just, a, I say quick kahoot. These are actually true false questions um, from unit seven. So give us a nice quick little uh, recap. Hopefully you're getting into, don't rely on Kahoot to tell you how you're doing with this material. Uh, Kahoot is very basic. Hopefully you're getting into end of unit quizzes, um, online learning system quizzes, or those application tests. So you got your QR code, or you're going to the website or the app, grabbing your app, website or app, you need a, a game pin. <laughs> Mary Ellie, your little koala bear has an ice cream on it. <laughs> that is adorable. <laughs> Do y'all get to choose your avatars? No, they just said, wouldn't it be a lot funner if they let you, if they let you piece fill these things? We would never get anything done. Y'all would be too busy picking your avatar. We wouldn't have time for all that. <laughs> I see your phone, Ashley, but I can't see uh, what's on it. Oh, your avatars. The avatars are new. The background. The hoots up their game in the last, even again in the last six months. Y'all can probably hear it now. Can you hear a little Kahoot music? I find Kahoot music rather annoying, but you know, not my cup of tea when it comes to music. Let's put it that way. Hello. Everybody in that wants to play? It's like somebody's phone might have gone to sleep. Okay. All right, let's go. Unit seven, guys. True, false. You got a 50 50 shot. Read carefully. I'm going to review some agency. True or false? An agent must provide obedience to third parties. Ten seconds. There we go. What do third parties get? Let's route them off together. Honesty, fairness, and the disclosure material facts. I saw nobody rattling it off with me. What do third parties get? Honesty, fairness, and the disclosure material facts. What do your clients get? OCAR, and within OCAR includes obedience. Questions on this one? Let's see who's the fastest tonight. Tess got out the fastest, followed by Michaela, Maddie, DA, and Sean. Question number two, true or false? An agent's duty includes disclosing all material facts to all parties involved in the transaction. Eight seconds. We always have a duty to disclose material facts, regardless if you're talking to a customer or a client. We always have a duty to disclose material facts. It doesn't matter who I am. What role am I playing? My listing agent, buyer's agent, seller sub agent, dual agent, designated dual agent, doesn't matter. We always have a duty to disclose material facts. Questions on this one? So now we got Tess is staying on top. Alyssa climbed up. DA still on. Sean's still on. Maddie's on the board.
Question number three, failure to disclose material facts is considered a misrepresentation by the agent. Failure to disclose means what? You kept your mouth shut. You omitted it. If a misrepresentation, you opened your mouth and a big old lie fell out. So we got two choices, how we mishandle material facts. You either lie about it or you keep your mouth shut. It's either a misrepresentation or an omission. This is some good cahooting tonight. Questions on this one? Try, uh, you may want to try log out and log back in after Kahoot if you're playing. So now we got DA climbed up. Uh, Mary Ellie's up. Jasmine's up. Tess is there. Alyssa. Uh, looks like Barry's our highest climber up five places. Question number four, customer's motivation for engaging in a transaction must be disclosed. Five seconds. Customer's motivation for engaging in a transaction. That's not true, is it? I agree with you guys. My goodness, we just found a fault in Kahoot, didn't we? This is going to mess up our rankings. Oh, my goodness. Oh, it's bad. It's so bad. All right, customer's motivation. Remember we talked about um, PTM, price, term, and motivation, particularly PTM about this transaction. <laughs> Let me make myself a note to fix. Mm -hmm. Must be disclosed. No, we are not going to disclose that. So, so even if it's a customer versus a client. Yeah. Look at Sean go. Yeah, because that's how I thought about. Ding, this ding, 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 ding. Cahoots <laughs> right. <laughs> Julie's wrong. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. Yep, that yeah. one word means it, doesn't it? Customer, we tell our client everything about our customer. We tell our customer nothing about our client. Good job. I did that on purpose to see, no. <laughs> Questions on this one? <laughs> Everybody good? I didn't confuse us too much. Really? I'm sorry. Yeah. So is this, is this true? Well, did you say this was an error or? Nope, nope, it's true. Okay. Yep, because we, we just tell our client everything about our customer. We tell our customer, that's the key word right there. If this was a client, then we're not going to disclose their motivation. Yep. Everybody good? Okay. So the podium's right. DA stayed on top. Nicole came up, Mary Ellie, Jasmine and Nicola. Uh, is it is it Zain, Zainab? Am I saying that right? Is that Zainab? Where is she? Let me see if I can get a thumbs up. Oh, you need to rename yourself. Yeah, that is that is right, Zainab. That was right. Z yeah. Say it again. Zainab. Zainab. Thank you. Thank you. So you're our highest climber. You're up five places this round. Last one. Working with real estate agent disclosure is required in all real estate transactions. Four seconds. Is it required in all transactions? All of them? No, just sales. We tend to forget about lease transactions, maybe because we haven't covered it yet. I don't know. But be weary of these questions, you guys. 
when they say all real estate transactions, they're talking about lease, sales, everything. The disclosure is only required with sales transactions. Questions on this one? Brittany, you're good now. Whatever you did fixed it. Yep. Okay. Good job, you guys. First, or sorry, third place, we have Nicole. Second place, we have Mary Ellie. And first place, we have DA. We got runners up, fourth and fifth, Jasmine and Nicola. Questions? Yeah, I can't stress the importance of going back over agency. Please incorporate agency soon to be contracts into your daily or your study routines. Because if you leave agency now and pick it up again in March, it's almost like starting over. So just do a little bit just to keep it fresh. Yeah. No question? Next week, we'll start getting into contracts. We'll talk well, tomorrow before we leave. Uh, but yeah, we start getting into contracts as early as next week. All right, we got to stop this meeting. All right. So we are back in unit eight. Still talking about agency, but now talking more about contracts and, and these agreements, these arrangements with our buyers and the sellers. And we less left last night talking about the different reasons of why we're going to use a listing agreement so now we're going to start talking about different ways let me think of, let me make sure i say this right i'm not going to tell you how you can solicit customers remember i'm not here to teach you how to be real estate agents that's not my job what we do need to talk about is what you can't do to solicit customers and clients what you can't do to solicit business and the first thing you cannot do to solicit business is solicit somebody else's active client. You can't go after a client if you know they're in an agency agreement with somebody else. You know a seller is in an agency agreement with another firm because their home is listed for sale in the multiple listing services. They can't get it in MLS without being represented. So you cannot go through the MLS and call those sellers and say, your a I could do better than your agent, fire them and hire me. We can't do that. Um, as a buyer, you guys ever been open housing and the agents ever asked you, are you working with an agent? Anybody ever had that? Have you ever been asked that before? We're not being nosy. We're asking because if you are working with an agent, we're gonna respect that. We're gonna honor the fact that you're working with that agent. Once you affiliate with your firm and you join the local board of realtors, that'll get you into the state level, which is the North Carolina Association of Realtors. And that'll also get you into the National Association of Realtors. It's three tiered, if you will. And if you join NAR, NAR has code of ethics that we as realtors need to follow. Uh, that's one thing that stands realtors out from non-realtors is the code of ethics. You'll get your code of ethics training when you join the local board. It'll be part of your new agent onboarding. But just know that one of the things covered in NAR's code of ethics is the fact that we cannot solicit other firms, active clients. You may or may not join NAR. Your firm may or may not require it. So if you don't join M NAR, you still don't have a golden ticket to solicit other people's clients. Um, if you're not a member of NAR and you try to solicit, that may get you into something called torturous interference. And that's like wrongfully interfering with somebody's business relationship. That could have you standing in front of a judge, possibly the real estate commission. So member or non-member, we can't solicit. Yes, National Association of Realtors, yep. What if 
the buyer or seller that's in a current agency agreement with another firm reaches out to you. That's kind of a different story now. When I solicit, I mean their contact, your contact them, but what if they contact you? First off, I need you guys to document that they reached out to you, right? I need you to show that they contacted you first. If they contact you first, guys, let's always be professional. We always need to be reminded that they are in an existing agency agreement. We can't, you know, we can't release them from that agency agreement. Uh, it is recommended that we encourage that person that reached out to you to discuss with their agent, to discuss with their agent's BIC, you know, try to solve that existing relationship. Once that agency agreement expires or the other firm releases them from the agency agreement, then we can start working with them. Does that make sense? But as long as they are in an active agency agreement, it pans off. Because remember, those agency agreements are exclusive, which means the buyer, the seller can only date how many firms? How many firms? Just one. So they got to break up with the other firm or end the relationship with the other firm before they can start a relationship with you. So again, if they contact you, just be professional about it. Encourage them to talk to their BIC. If they tell you they've terminated, I may even go so far as to ask for a termination agreement, just so I know for sure that that agreement is over. But again, if the BIC wants to release them, that's going to be up to the BIC. Questions on soliciting. Another thing when we're out uh, trying to find consumers, trying to find business, we got to honor the do not call registry. Uh, some of you may know the do not call registry. You put your phone number on here and supposedly you don't get spam robo calls. Anybody have a different experience than that? My gosh, some days I swear all day long. I don't know how they get away with it, but I know what we need to know. And what we need to know is if you think you're going to get business by picking up the phone and calling people, before you pick up the phone, you've got to get your hands on the do not call registry. Now there's a cost for it. I don't know how much. You can go to the website, learn all about it. Maybe your firm will go in with it with you. Maybe they won't. But what we need to understand here again is that you cannot pick up the phone to solicit business until you've checked with that do not call registry. And if they are on the do not call registry, then you can't call them. That's what that means. They've already said, don't call me when they signed up for that registry. There are a few exceptions to this rule. There are a few exceptions to when we can call people, even if they're on the do not call. If you have formerly had a relationship, if this was a former client, because you had a relationship, you can call them. If they're on the do not call, you can call them for up to 18 months after your relationship ends or until they tell you to stop calling. Anytime anybody says, stop calling me, we've got to honor their requests. So former client up to 18 months after the end of the relationship. Uh, if you get somebody's phone number through a soft inquiry, let's say, for example, they come into your open house and leave their phone number on your open house registry. Or maybe they send you a message through your website and leave their phone number and say, contact me. If you obtain their phone number through a soft inquiry and they are on the do not call, you can call them for up to three months after the inquiry or until they say, stop calling. We've always got to honor their requests. The other exception is if a for sale by owner, is the for sale by owner is on the do not call registry. We can call that for sale by owner only if we have a legitimately interested buyer. We cannot call that for sale by owner to solicit their listing. 
So you got a buyer, they're interested, we can call the FISBO even if they're on the do not call. Penalties for violating this, man, they're no joke. Very last thing on page 189, page 189, you're looking at fines of up to $11,000 per call, federal, State fines are 500 to 5,000. Again, if this is the route you're gonna go, cold calling is what it's called, cold calling. If you're gonna go this route, gotta get your hands on this list. Questions on this? What is FISBO? Wait. For sale by owner. The other thing we need to be aware of with soliciting is when we're sending out mass emails. Mass emails fall under something called the Can Spam Act. Now you don't need to know this, but Can Spam on page 190 uh, is defined as the Controlling the Assault of Non-Solicited Pornography and Marketing Act, Can Spam. And it's the act that um, again, it's about mass emails. If you want to send a mass marketing email, the can spam act says that the recipient has to have the option to unsubscribe. Do you ever get mass emails? And at the very bottom, teeny tiny letters, it says click here to unsubscribe. Evidently they don't regulate how big that font has to be, but as long as you have that link, that ability um, you got to provide that opt out option. If they hit reply and respond to your email, instead of clicking on unsubscribe, if they hit reply and say, please remove me from your list, we're going to honor that request. We're going to go in and remove it. <clears throat> Questions? So just for fun, why don't you guys tell us in a chat? I've just given you a few things you can't do. So why don't we share real quick some things that we can do to solicit business? What are some things we can do? Door to door. Social media. Meet the neighbors. I like that. Snail mail. It still exists, doesn't it? Mailing flyers putting something in their hand. Isn't it nice to walk out to the mailbox some, sometimes and get something that isn't a bill? <laughs> Business cards, websites, Google ads. Possibilities are kind of endless here, right? Think outside the box when it comes to your marketing and your advertising. Let me say a few things. If you go door to door, it's suggested that you take a buddy, their safety in numbers. Also, if you go door to door and the door says no trespassing or no soliciting, they're already telling you they don't want you knocking on their door. Uh, social media, online advertising, business cards. Business cards are good. You may find at some point in your career, you may find a real estate coach that may tell you that before you leave your house every morning, you put five business cards in your pocket and you don't come home until you put one in five people's hands. It's kind of a numbers game, isn't it? If you get out, if you give out enough business cards, somebody's bound to call you. If you give out no business cards, how many people are gonna call you? Yeah, right, right? It's a numbers game. So again, you guys, the possibilities are endless. Billboards I'm seeing, we're still coming in. Flyers, yep, yep. There you go. Flyers in a parade or a festival. I'm digging that. Somebody else said the pig picking festival. You got the dill pickle festival. The possibilities are endless here. Uh, so you can't just sit at home and watch Netflix. Well, you work for you. So if you want to sit at home all day and watch Netflix, there's nobody telling you otherwise, right? I don't know how you're going to get paid, but... <laughs> 
hot, hot air balloon. Are you going to go work for a company that starts with an R? <laughs> So again, you guys think outside the box with your marketing, your advertising, um, you know, you got to sometimes you got to try some things. It's throwing spaghetti at the wall, right? Some things may work. Some things may not. Uh, talking about a foreign broker, a foreign broker would be somebody with an active license from another state that wants to refer business to you in North Carolina. So first off, everybody's good that you're like, your North Carolina's license is only good for the state of North Carolina, right? If the property is located anywhere else, you have to have a license in that state. So, and this could work both ways. This could be you sending business to somebody in another state. You could be the foreign broker. If you refer business across state lines, as long as you have an active license, you could get paid a commission or excuse me, a referral fee. So um, some of you may have friends or families outside or in another state. You know, when you're telling everybody you know that you got your real estate license, don't discount those out of state people. Because when your cousin in Pennsylvania decides that they want to sell, they can call you, you can refer them to an agent there and you can get a referral fee. So when you're letting the world know <laughs> that you have your license, um, again, if you wanna be paid that referral fee, you got your license has to be active and you can't go to that state for the purpose of conducting business. So if somebody sends you business from another state, they can't come here to do business. If you send business to another state, you can't get go there. I mean, could I go to Pennsylvania and visit my cousin? Sure. I can't get involved in that real estate transaction because my license doesn't allow me to. Restart always, almost always works, doesn't it? Uh, how much referral fee? Up to the firm. Are you gonna get all the referral fee? Are they gonna take some of it? All up to the firm. All comes down to that firm's policy. Something else we need to pay attention to is some antitrust laws, specifically Sherman antitrust laws. Sherman antitrust laws are not just about real estate, but it does apply to real estate. The whole point of antitrust laws is to prohibit monopolies. Real estate specifically is an open market. It should allow for free trade. And anything that restrains that free trade is a violation of our antitrust laws. So a couple specifics that we cannot do. Uh, we cannot price fix. Your firm determines how much commission they expect to collect when this transaction is over. The firm decides the commission. It doesn't come from the local board of realtors. It doesn't come from the North Carolina Real Estate Commission. It is a firm policy, how much they're gonna charge and how much they're gonna give you, what your split is gonna be. You need to be very careful because when you go to a listing appointment and you're sitting there in front of the seller and at some point during this listing appointment, the seller will look at you and say, how much do you charge? And you need to be very careful how you answer that. The right answer is my firm charges X amount. What we cannot say or should not say is everybody in the area charges the same thing. We all charge the same commission. You've just engaged in price fixing. So, you know, I'm getting, we're getting questions about, well, how much commission and how much are they charging? How much of a referral fee was that? It all comes down to the firm's policy. I always encourage you guys before you sign up with a firm to talk to two or three different firms. So you have something to compare and contrast. Talk to a couple. 
and look at their compensation plans. Look at their compensation splits. Uh, we're going to talk about your compensation splits probably tomorrow night. We'll get to whip out our calculator and do your math, help you figure out how much. But all firms are different when it comes to commission. Um, we can't compare our pricings to others. Again, when you're sitting in front of that seller, you can't say, well, I know Julie's real estate shop down the street charges more than I do. So you get the same thing with me that you do with her. See what I'm saying? You can't compare your commission. You can't give the generalization that we all are in this together, driving the commission that's being charged. There is absolutely nothing right about that statement. You are correct. That's a, and I don't even want to read it out loud because I won't confuse anybody, but you, that's right. That's right. Everything about that. I just got the chat that said that a broker just once told her, everyone in this area charges X amount, but I'll give you a deal. Man, that's price fixing all day long. And that's, I said I wasn't going to read it, but I did. But that's, uh, you know, thank you for not name dropping. Uh, <laughs> um, the other antitrust law we have is something called group, group boycotting. Group boycotting, when two or more people or two or more businesses get together for the purposes of driving somebody else out of the business, conspiring together to work somebody else out. So let's say, for example, I'm a buyer's agent and we go under contract and my buyer has a home inspection and the home inspection was just, I mean, it was horrible. The home inspector didn't know what he was doing. The report was bad. I mean, it was just nothing about it was good. I'm, a, I'm not happy. My buyer's not happy. I can choose not to refer that home inspector to my next buyer, right? I don't have to recommend that home inspector. What group boycotting says is I can't go into the office after that experience and say, guys, so-and-so gave us a terrible home inspection. Let's just all agree that none of us are gonna refer him or recommend them anymore. Does that make sense? We can't come together for the purpose of driving, driving him out of business. Y'all trust me, if that home inspector is bad enough, he will drive himself out of business. He does not need your help. So we can't work together to push somebody out. Another antitrust is the allocation or the dividing of markets. We can't divide our markets, divide our customers, divide the competition. I may choose to only work Forsyth County. I can work the entire state, but I may choose only to work Forsyth County. That's my choice. You may choose to only work Guilford County. That's your choice. What we can't do is look at each other and say, all right, I'm gonna only work Forsyth. I'm never gonna step foot into Guilford. You're only gonna work Guilford. You'll never step foot into Forsyth. That's dividing the markets. I have just as much a right to go into Guilford County as you do to come into Forsyth. So we can choose where we wanna work, but we can't get together to divide those markets. Again, penalties for antitrust laws, that's the last paragraph from 191. We are looking at a $100,000 fine and possibly three years in prison. Questions? Let's talk about some money. Let's talk about your commission a little bit. Earning your commission. First off, let me rephrase that. It's not your commission. Whose commission do you think it is? It is the firm's commission. The firm shares their commission with you. How much do they share with you? It depends on their company policy. 
and your independent contractor agreement. Again, compare a couple. Talk to two or three so you have something to compare and contrast. They're all different. Commission is typically a percentage of the sales price or a flat fee. Remember what we said the word of means sometimes? The word of can mean multiply. So when we talk about a percentage of the sales price, you're gonna get a percentage of whatever you sell it for. Or it could be a flat fee, uh, depending on if the, you know, how the firm wants to charge. If you wanna get paid, you have to have an active license. The firm, has to have an active license to collect the commission. If your license goes inactive, for example, you're not entitled to a commission anymore. We're gonna talk about active status, inactive, all that when we get to our license law commission rule. I'm gonna tell you guys how you can keep your license active once you get it active to keep it active. So you can always get paid. And then the third piece for earning a commission, you gotta be in, an, in a, um, affiliated with the firm that either has the listing agreement or the one that brings that ready, willing, and able buyer. Remember our three-legged stool, that ready, willing, and able buyer. So you're either affiliated with the listing firm or you're affiliated with a firm that brings the buyer. Maybe it's a listing firm, maybe it's a different firm. There is something, and it's in your book, uh, we're over on page 192, about halfway down. There's something called procuring cause. If there's ever a question about who is earned a commission, if there's several agents saying, well, I've been working with this buyer, I've been working with this buyer. If there's ever a question about who is earning the, the commission, they're gonna look for this procuring cause. Who was the one that started this course of events that led to this buyer buying? What another good reason to document everything? Because if they're trying to determine who gets paid, you need to be able to show your actions that you were the one that introduced the buyer to this property. Remember, buyers can, an oral buyer agency can work with different firms. So, So let's make sure we understand something. There's a difference when you earn your commission versus when you actually get paid. We earn our commission when we brokerage the deal, when we connect the buyer and the seller. We have a seller that wants to sell and we have a ready, willing and able buyer. And technically when we connect the two, we've earned our commission. However, we typically don't get paid until and if it closes. It's gonna be really rare to get you paid if it doesn't close. So there's the difference in when we earn it versus when we actually get it. The firm may decide if the buyer or seller don't close for any reason, the firm may decide to go after the buyer or the seller for the firm's commission. You, the individual agent, cannot. Remember that agency agreement is not between the client and you, it's between the client and the firm. So the firm would have to make the decision if they're gonna go after that commission or not. And I'll be really honest with you, most firms don't go after buyers and sellers for commission if it doesn't close if it doesn't close. Because firms typically don't want that reputation of suing sellers at the drop of a hat. That's not how you get sellers and buyers, right? I wish I could stand here and tell you guys that they're all gonna close every time. But I'm not gonna lie to you because sometimes they don't close. Comments on that? I need to let that soak in for a second. Y'all want to hear a horrible story? Good rainy day, horrible story. I had buyers. We were three hours away from closing. And they called me and said, we're not going. 
And I said, I'm kind of naive sometimes. And I said, "Uh oh, do you want me to reschedule it? And they said, no, no, Julie, <laughs> we are not buying this house. All right. That one was tough. That one was tough. Y'all don't spend that money till it's in your hand. We went back out a couple of days later, started looking at more properties, found them another one, got them close on that one. So I did eventually get paid for those buyers, just not on that transaction. Three hours. I mentally had that money spent, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Questions on that? Comments? Not the story, the earning a commission. There is a commission rule, A.0109. Again, I'm not asking you to read this rule. I'm just putting here for reference. If you do want to read it, uh, you got the license law and commission rule, a couple different sources that we talked about. I do, I need to go back one second. I apologize. Um, hold your place in the book and turn with me real quick to page 218. What we're looking at on 218, we're in the throes in your book of the conversation about the agency agreement, and we will get there. We're going to talk about that later tonight. But, you know, as we say typically your commission is going to be a percent of the sales price or a flat fee. There is also something out there called a net listing. So on page 218, about halfway down, you guys see that a net listing. That could be another way for you to get a commission. Um, guys, these... <laughs> These are legal, but they're highly frowned upon. And I think I've never seen a net listing. I think it's gonna be really rare. But basically what these are, the, the seller looks at the listing firm and says, I need to sell the house for X amount. And then a net listing, the firm can list it for sale for whatever they want to and take everything over the seller's X amount. So if the seller says 100,000 and I can sell your house for 150, the firm's gonna pocket $50,000. That's not really fair to the seller, is it? If we can sell your house for 150, I'm gonna get more money because I'm probably looking at a percentage of the sales price. We can put more money in the seller's pocket. Again, these aren't illegal, uh, but they are highly frowned upon just because it creates an obvious conflict of interest. Typically what you're gonna see is a percentage of the sales or the flat fee commission rule. So we have, back to page 192, we have received a call from a seller that says, I'm interested in selling my home and I'd like to talk to you. Can we schedule time? And of course you do your silent little I'd be happy to talk to you. Thank you so much for calling me, you know? So you start get ready for this listing appointment. And when you're getting ready for this listing appointment, we need to start learning about the property. We do not wanna show up at this seller's front door with the listing appointment and know nothing about the home or the property. So before we go out, we need to pull the tax records, we need to look at the deed, we need to look at NCDOT, we need to look at the zoning, school boards. Um, is it in an HOA? Let's check out some covenants. We need to try to learn as much about this home as possible. Ideally, we know everything about this home except for what the inside looks like before we ever get there. And when you have a listing that's ever been an MLS, MLS never gets rid of anything. So when you have a listing that's ever been there, you can always look at the history and you could see pictures. Just, you know, the pictures don't, they tell you what they look like before they bought it, but that may not tell you what they did to it once they bought it. Did they knock a wall down? Did they not do anything? You know, so you can get an idea from the pictures, but really we don't know what the inside looks like until we walk through. Competitive listing appointments, are a very real thing right now. 
which means sellers are talking to two, three agents before they decide who to hire. Maybe you know you're on a competitive listing appointment. Maybe you don't. So we need to take, we need to go to every listing appointment and take our A game. Pretend like they're all competitive because you never know when you're in competition with somebody. So I just looked up and I saw Claudia. So Claudia, I'm going to pick on you. So let's say Claudia and I are two agents, two different firms, and we're going on a listing appointment to the same property, same seller. Uh, Claudia is going to go in the morning and I'm going to go that afternoon. Claudia and I have no idea that we're in a competitive listing appointment. So Claudia goes that morning and she's done her research. She knows who's on the deed. She says something about, hey, I understand that they're considering redrawing the, the school board lines. You know, I know what taxes you paid last year. I mean, Claudia knows everything about the home. Claudia leaves and they say, wow, that's good. And then I show up in the afternoon and I say, do y'all know your zoning? Do you know if DOT is going to do anything? Is there anything you need to, who looks like the better agent in this case? Who's going to get the job? Congratulations, Claudia, because she did her research. She learned about the property. I hate it when I lose a listing, <laughs> but I did that to myself, didn't I? So we got to do the research. We got to learn about the home um, before we go. So we can have like conversations with the seller about it. There you go. There you go. Somebody just said, if you see, if you see a wall that existing in the old pictures and that wall's not there anymore, don't I got to ask some questions about permits? So the pictures could help lead you to some red flags. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. Way to do your research. So we're learning about the property before we get there. Maybe I'll get the listing. Maybe I won't. If you know nothing about it, you probably got a good chance of not getting it. Does that make sense? So we're doing our research and you can learn a whole lot. Again, that deed tells you who needs to convey the property. The people that need to convey the property and their spouses need to be on board from day one. I need everybody on the listing agreement. I need everybody to sign the contract. I would rather find out there's somebody not on board on day one than when we're sitting at the closing table and they're saying, I'm not gonna sign. And it's a done deal. Not closed, but it's done. So we've got to do our research and ask the hard questions. Consider this, you guys. Listing agents, the big part of their work is done before you ever see the listing on Zillow.com. Because we're doing the research, the pictures, the measurements. We're getting all that together, which we are getting ready to talk about. There's a lot that goes into it before you ever see it on the websites. So we're learning about the home. We're also going to, along with the seller, try to gather some documents, gather some information. Um, ask the seller for a copy of their deed. Yeah, I can pull it up the tax or the, uh, the, the public records, but don't I want to make sure the two match? Can I verify that the two match, the deed we're working with is the one that we both have? Um, your sellers may be able to help you get those covenants if it's in an HOA a good buyer's agent is gonna ask for them. So why not go ahead and get those so we can provide them? Uh, the seller, if they had a survey done, maybe we can ask to see their survey. I'm not necessarily gonna share it with the buyer. Most sellers don't go for that. Buyers are always encouraged to get their own, but looking at their survey will help me better understand their property lines, understanding I'm not a surveyor, uh, but help me better understand those property lines. Another thing from the seller that we need to get, maybe not at the first meeting if you're in a competitive listing. So the competitive listing, you're kind of doing your uh, dog and pony dance, you know, to win the listing. But once you know you're going to get the business very early in the relationship, we need to learn from the seller what their outstanding liens are. We need to find out what their approximate first mortgage balance is, second mortgage, third mortgage. Because in doing your research to get ready for this listing appointment, you know about what you want to list it for. I will talk about that for a minute. And if all of the seller's outstanding debts start adding up and they start exceeding what you think you're going to be able to sell it for, we got to have the hard talk with the seller, don't we? Like, can you afford to sell? Can you afford to bring money to the closing table? Once again, I ask you, do you want to have a hard conversation up front to see, make sure your seller can afford to sell? 
or do you want to wait until you get to the closing table or the day before closing and the seller say, I don't have that kind of money. I can't bring that to closing. I think this is tough sometimes because in a case we're looking at total strangers saying, mm -hmm, how much debt you got on this property? But we got to ask the hard questions up front, not only to protect the seller, but to protect you as well. We'll see this in our listing agreement where we actually list their approximate balances on their outstanding liens. We actually list it. So the seller and I both know that we're all in agreement. Questions or comments? So let's go ahead and take our first break. Hey, Come back, we're gonna, yeah. I had a question for you before we break. Sure. Um, You're on mute. I'm sorry. Yep. Nope. Hey, when you were talking about allocating markets, it made me mm -hmm. think of non-compete clauses. Do you see those at all in real estate? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Particularly uh maybe management or admin. People who get higher yeah. up in the company. Mm -hmm. So it might be if you leave us, then you can't, you know, go. But yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point, Sean. But um, you're not. Mm, that's an interesting point. Yeah, I see them all the time. I'm not sure how now I do. But <laughs> I was just curious. Yeah, I mean, I, we see them all the time in my, you know, industry. So I just I didn't know if most agents being independent contractors if that was really a thing i think um the good advice there is to read that contract with your firm before you sign it because you gotta always it's so funny to say this but when you join a firm you got to think about what happens when i leave and yep. you, you know you're so excited you're joining the firm why would i ever go anywhere but you know things can happen and you need to know is that something you may need to deal with yeah that's a great point Cool. Thank you. I may make a note to find out more about that, but yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. All right. Let's take 10.
We back. You guys try to eat dinner on breaks. Is that what the night class does? Try to scarf something down. All right. So cameras are on. And set your private chats. I got a question for you guys as we're coming back. So let me take attendance first. And I got a question for you guys in the private chat. So one of the early things that you're going to do with the seller, maybe it's at the pre-listing, uh, maybe it's at, the, excuse me, at the competitive listing, maybe it's at, it's not competitive and you know you're at an appointment, maybe you know you're going to get the listing. There's no like wrong way to do this, right? But one of the very first things, I need you guys to tell me what is one of the very first things that you're going to do when you first meet this seller. What is one of the very first things very early in your relationship, very, very early in your relationship, <laughs> in your relationship. <laughs> Always that one. <laughs> before you get too involved, before you get too in depth, before you get too close. So I'm hearing from some of you. One of the very first things you need to do when you're first meeting the seller, may it be on the phone or in person, is you're working with real estate agent disclosure. Is it going to happen on the phone when you schedule the appointment? Is first substantial going to contact going to happen then? I don't know. Is first substantial contact going to happen when you're sitting at the home at the listing appointment? I don't know. I don't know when first substantial contact with this seller is going to happen. However, I know it's probably going to happen. So one of the early things that we need to do is make sure we do our working with real estate agent disclosure because the seller needs to understand that until they hire me, I don't owe them confidentiality. Remember, we just talked about our competitive listing appointment. Claudia got the listing, right? I didn't. What if the seller shared something with me at that competitive listing appointment? And now, since I didn't get it, Claudia's got the listing. But now I bring the buyer to the transaction. Don't I have a duty to share that with my buyer? And doesn't the seller have the right to know up front that I have the duty to share that with the buyer? So we need to make sure, again, maybe you know you're in a competitive listing, maybe you don't, but we still need to make sure that we do our disclosure so we can caution the seller um, if they, for whatever reason, if they don't hire you, they don't have your loyalty. Your loyalty doesn't belong to them. Again, does I don't know. Is it on the phone? Is it at the home? It doesn't matter. Here's the thing, you guys. When you show up for a listing appointment, I mean, sellers are proud. This is their home, for goodness sakes. To everybody else in the world, this is just a house. But to the seller, this is their home. Do they not have more value in their home than everybody else in the world? I mean, sure. Blood, sweat, and tears went in this. You know, remember when little Johnny fell right there and scraped his knee? Oh, you know, there's memories. There's stuff going on. It's their home. And when you show up for your list for the listing appointment, they're they're proud. They want to give you the grand tour. But we need to be the ones in control, kind of slow it down just a bit. You know, before we get too involved in the tour, before we get too in depth of this conversation, make sure they understand this working with real estate agent disclosure, this confidentiality or non-confidentiality thing. Getting ready for the listing, well, we need to um, inspect the property, walk through it with the seller, look at our listing data sheet, um, gather the information we need to put it in MLS. I have a sample listing data sheet for you guys in the online learning system. Um, we'll look at that. Thank you guys for telling me that you're back. 
We need to ask questions. Have you had any recent renovations or repairs? Remember those red flags that we're always on the lookout for. If your little red flag goes up while you're looking through the home, you need to ask questions. We need to, which we should before we go, one thing we can look up is whether or not it's on a public sewer or on site. Uh, if it's on site, who remembers how many human heartbeats per bedroom? If we have an on site septic system, how many human heartbeats? Yeah, two human heartbeats per bedroom. So if the septic permit says three bedrooms, all I can advertise is three bedrooms. And what it's saying is that this on site septic system will hold the capacity of six people. Discuss your marketing plan. How does your firm, how do you, the individual agent, plan to advertise and market? Y'all don't go into the seller, look at the seller and say, well, I'll put your listing in MLS. You know what every single agent does? Puts the listing in MLS. How are you gonna stand out? What are you gonna do different? How are you going to market or advertise their home to make it sell? Um, we're going to somehow determine square footage. I will talk about square footage in a bit, um, how we determine that, our options for that. You may want to suggest repairs, things that you think may make it sellable. If they have a room that's painted hot pink, <laughs> I personally don't have a problem with that, but some buyers might. So maybe you suggest they paint the room. Is there something with landscaping we can do for that curb appeal? I can't make anybody do anything, right? But I can make suggestions. I can make recommendations, things they may wanna do before I list. We gotta ask the questions. Uh, this listing data sheet, again, I got a sample for you guys to look at. Um, I actually take it with me when I go because as I'm going through the home, I wanna be able to make notes on it right there. This may sound horrible, but I'm here to tell you guys after a while, all these homes that you see kind of run together. And so the last thing you want is to get home and be like, now did this house have that? Or is that another house that I saw? So the way you keep them separate is by taking good notes. You know, have your listing data sheet with you, take pictures if allowed, you know, if the seller's okay with that. Um, but do things that you can to make sure that you can best market and advertise the property. We're skipping, I'm on page 193. We're gonna skip to page 204. What we're skipping is the listing agreement. Remember, we're not looking at the listing agreement in the book. We're looking at the one in the online learning system in just a minute, actually. On 204, it talks about ways that the buyer's agent can earn commission. Um, the success fee, that's when you've successfully done your job. You, again, you earn your commission when you connect that buyer to the desired property that they're looking to for, when you connect the two. Your firm may allow you to collect a retainer fee. The retainer fee is an agreement up front. You pay X amount up front. If it, um, it's like a portion of your commission up front. If it closes, most of the time it's deducted from the total commission. If it doesn't, then the agent's been paid for their time, mileage, that kind of thing. If your firm allows you to collect a retainer fee, you cannot collect a retainer fee with an oral buyer agency agreement. So if collecting a retainer fee is something you wanna look into, you gotta get that thing in writing before they can require them. Couple more just for a reference, uh, talking about the firm compensating the broker, uh, making sure you get paid. The 93A.6 is the license law. That's one I have in, in the online learning system for you guys. This one in the um, Campbell folder and the online learning system. I think you guys should read that. That's disciplinary action from the real estate agent. So it does discuss commission compensation in that. The other one is commission rule 58A.0120. Uh, again, that's just a commission rule, just as a reference. Guys, basically what both of these are saying is that the provisional broker 
nor the full broker can get paid from anybody other than their firm. So you cannot receive commission directly from a principal because it's not your principal. So they pay the firm, the firm pays you. Your commission runs through the firm. <clears throat> skipping ahead in your book one more time to 211. Again, what we're skipping is the buyer's agency agreement. We'll look at that in the online learning system. And on page 211, it talks a little bit more about commission, about splitting fees. So there's several different scenarios to consider. Uh, a co-brokered sale is two firms working together. We're cooperating together. So ABC has the seller, XYZ Realty has the buyer. The commission that the listing firm is offering the selling firm is advertised in MLS. It's something that doesn't go out to the public site. It's something that only members can see. So you as the agent, when your buyer says, I wanna see 123 Main Street, when you pull up 123 Main Street in MLS, you can see how much commission the listing firm is offering you. Remember, if the seller hires a firm, the seller pays the listing firm, the listing firm shares their commission with whomever brings the buyer. The relationship with the commission, the agreement is between the seller and the listing firm. We're gonna see where we agree to how much commission. We're gonna see where we even share with the seller how we're gonna split that with the selling firm. So it's a co-brokered sale. We're advertising to all members in MLS. If you bring me this ready, willing, and able buyer, this is how much we're gonna pay you. Remember we said all firms policies are different. So the listing firm may not be offering what your firm expects to collect. For example, one time I had a buyer interested in a property and I looked at the commission and it said 0.5%, a half of 1%. Remember I told you I'm a little naive. So I called the listing agent and said, I think I found a mistake in your MLS. <laughs> she said, no. <laughs> I said, oh, well, I'm not gonna tell you what my firm expects to collect when I bring the ready, willing and able buyer. But I am gonna tell you that 0.5% ain't gonna cut it. This was all the listing firm was willing to share with me. Think this through, you guys. There's two parties in the contract transaction. There's the seller and the buyer. So if the seller's not going to pay me, who's left? The buyer. That's why we have a buyer's agency agreement. If the seller can't or won't pay me enough, my option was to go to my buyer to collect from them. Before I even showed this property, I called my buyers and said they're not offering enough. If you like it and move forward, you're going to have to pay me some commission. And they said, okay, it's part of our agency agreement, our buyer's agency agreement, making sure that we are protected with our commission. Half a percent. So co-brokered sale. You could also have an in-house transaction, both buyer and seller are represented by the same firm. How all that gets split up in-house all comes down to firm policy. Firm policy will tell you how much you can get for a co-brokered, how much you can give for a co-brokered, how much you will get with an in-house sale, in-house transaction. The other splitting of fees that we may see is a co-listing. You may have the opportunity, your firm may have the opportunity to share a listing with another firm. How much are we gonna charge the seller? Now both firms have to agree. Both firms have to agree how to split that commission. Um, do I have any uh, Burlington people, Mebin, 
wits it down in that area. It's kind of a, as far as MLSs go, that's kind of a gray area because they fall under the umbrella of both the triad MLS and the triangle MLS. So for example, some sellers may choose to hire two firms, one from triad, one from triangle and have them co-listed. That may be an example of when we co-list. If you had a $5 million property, you may wanna hire two firms to help market and advertise that. I don't know, percentage of $5 million? Yeah, I'll share that. No problem whatsoever. Uh-oh. So just the different ways, bottom line, it pretty much comes down to the firm policy. Remember, it is their commission. <clears throat> So then we need to, we go on and we talk about a couple different types of listing agreements we have. There's not just one listing agreement. There's one that's used the most often, but there are several different types of listing agreements. These tend to be a problem topic. The first type of listing agreement we have is something called an open listing. Open meaning there are multiple agents. The, the, the seller is hiring several different agents. However, the only one that's gonna get paid is the one that brings the buyer. So if you hire five agents to list the property, if one of them sell it, they'll be the one to get paid. If somebody else sells it, then that somebody else is gonna get paid. And this seller retains the right to sell it on their own. If they go to work tomorrow and they're chit-chatting with a coworker in the, in the break room and they sell it without you, they don't have to pay anybody. How does this sound? Everybody liking this? Before you log out of Zoom, hang on. Most MLSs do not allow open listings. I know for a fact Triad doesn't allow it. I know for a fact Charlotte doesn't allow it. I cannot speak for other MLSs. My point is, is we don't see these often. That's better news, isn't it? However, they can still be out there, maybe smaller markets, smaller than the Triad and Charlotte. So we do need to be aware of them. Your firm will have a policy on hand to how to handle all these. So this is the less favored one. Then we have an exclusive agency listing. And an exclusive agency listing, how many firms is the seller dating? All right, now we're getting better, right? Now the seller's just dating one firm. There's only one firm, one agent. If you sell that home, you get paid. If you don't, somebody else will get paid. And the seller still retains the right to sell it without you. So if the seller brings the buyer, they do not have to pay you. I'm sorry, you do get paid if you somebody else. So you do get commission, but the seller still retains the right to sell it without you and not pay you anything. These are allowed, but in my 22 years, I've never seen them. Not saying they're not out there, just saying I've never seen them. So what's the one we like? The one we like, the one we're getting ready to look at is something called the exclusive right to sell listing agreement. How many firms is the seller dating? One. And guess what? That firm gets paid no matter where the buyer comes from. Did you bring the buyer? Did somebody else bring the buyer? Did the seller sell it without you? That firm gets paid no matter what, when it sells. This is the one that we see the most often. This is the one that we're gonna look at and view in just a minute. So there's one agent, one firm. You get paid whenever it closes, whenever it sells.
to help summarize this, and y'all don't write this down. Um, I have pulled this PowerPoint slide out and put it all by itself in the online learning system. So when you look in the unit eight material, you have this as a piece all by itself. I think this is going to be more helpful in a month or so when you start getting ready for your exam, when you start reviewing, because it gives you a nice little summary. The dollar signs tell you when you get paid. And there's the each. There's the uh, open, the exclusive agency, and the exclusive right to sell. And then whether or not the seller retains the right to sell it without you. So this is, um, like I said, pulled out by itself. We'll look at what I got in unit eight material in just a bit. Questions? So I got a question for you guys. You got your private chat set? Let's hear from everybody. Tell me in a private chat, A, B, C, or D. I hear from everybody. Okay. I love it when you guys answer my questions with a question mark. Like, <laughs> are you asking me? I thought I was asking you. <laughs> I got one of you crossing your fingers. Anybody praying we get this one right? All right, let's see what we got. <laughs> so, <laughs> Devin begins marketing her new listing, which her office has the sole right to market. What's that tell you? How many can list it in Seoul? Just one. So that pretty much, stop reading right there. That pretty much eliminated C, didn't it? Net listing is referring to commission. So, I mean, yeah, let's knock that one out too. Sole meaning exclusive. Sole meaning only one firm. They have that right. A seller decides to sell the property directly to their cousin without going through Devin to avoid the obligation to pay a commission. The type of listing agreement Devin and the seller have is their exclusive agency agreement because the seller retains... <laughs> Prayers answer right because the seller retains the right to sell it on their own, right? It's exclusive, it's sold, meaning we just have one. But if the seller can avoid paying, it's just an exclusive agency agreement. The exclusive right to sell is the one that says you get paid no matter what, no matter where it comes from. Questions on this one? Let's try another one. Let's hear from everybody, A, B, C, or D.
Can we hear from everyone? So Thomas lists a property and begins marketing it. The seller sells the property directly to a coworker after telling them, telling it to them uh, at the break room and work. Despite Thomas's limited involvement, his firm still gets a commission. So what type of agreement are we talking about? Despite the fact that Thomas didn't sell it, right? Despite that, first off, let's rule out D. We can rule that out right away. What kind of agreement did we have? That says exclusive right to sell. Had it been an exclusive agency or an open listing, the seller wouldn't have paid Thomas. Does that make sense? Because the seller, and I would agree with the seller, they're the ones that sold the home, right? They sold it to their coworker in the break room. Had they had an B or C, then the seller wouldn't have to pay Thomas. Does that make sense? Exclusive meaning one, the only time that the seller doesn't have the right to retain themselves is the exclusive right to sell listing agreement. And then what would be, so what's the difference between, what is C? C is the open listing where we have multiple firms. It's non-exclusive. And the only agent that'll get paid is the one that brings the buyer. Okay. And if nobody brings the buyer, if the seller sells it in the break room, they don't have to pay anybody. So in that situation for an open listing, Who's putting in all the effort and time of creating the MLS entry? All the agents. They're wow. all doing the work. Okay. Open listings were a lot more popular before this phenomenon called the internet, right? Today, we put an MLS and that goes to, y'all, I'm not kidding when I say this. When I put a listing in MLS, the feed sends it out to like thousands of websites. Before the internet, we didn't have that ability. So some sellers wanted to hire multiple firms because some would do the real estate book. Some would do print media. Some would run it in the paper. You know what I'm saying? They had different, different platforms. So one reason, Thomas, why we used to see a lot more open listings was because of the marketing. Um, now we all put it in MLS. So that piece is taken care of and you don't need that exposure. Through the eyes of the sellers, it's about that exposure. They want to see their listing in all thousand of those websites. So my question to that. Oh. Yeah. So my question to. Turn your microphone. Hold on. Yeah, is your mic on? What's your. Uh... My microphone off? No, it's. Oh. It's just worried. oh, I'm sorry. So my question to you, and that is, you just mentioned the triad MLS and the other one. Charlotte. And versus whatever other one you said. So to me, the MLS means that it would go out to everybody in the state of North Carolina and the world. The world. I'm saying it only, why would I list it with the triad versus the triangle? Again, there's different marketing. You have a different reach, right? So that's internet advertising, but aren't there other ways to market and advertise? So if you got a triad agent and a triangle agent, One's running around Raleigh advertising your listing and the other ones are running around Greensboro. So it just be way, again, it's all about that exposure through the eyes of the seller. There's other ways to market besides putting it online. Okay, but the MLS, MLS actually goes, goes everywhere. everywhere. Correct. Yes? Yes. yes. Correct. Okay. I put, my, I put it in one time, an MLS, and it, I hit the button and I hold my breath every time because <laughs> I know once you hit submit, away it goes. Questions about the listing agreements. Again, the three. Y'all look at that side-by-side -side comparison. We have something in, let's see. So when it's all in an open listing and the agent is in the listing, it's in the MLS, can there be duplicate listings in the MLS? That's a really good question. I'm not sure how that would be handled for all in the same MLS with an open listing. And I don't know that because my MLSs don't allow it. So I don't have any personal experience with open listings. You know what I'm saying? Uh, my firm's a member of both Triad and Canopy. And so I have 
no idea. But you're right. If you had, now you got, you can't have multiple listings. So somehow they may have to agree if it were allowed, if it were allowed, somehow they may have to agree how we're going to handle that. See why we don't do open listings? I hear you guys. I hear you. You're like, why in the heck would anybody do it? Well, we just don't because there's so much conflict of interest here. So before the listing, would you establish what kind of listing? Because for A and B, like what if you're in, what if you, you don't talk about it? Well, do you talk about it first? That's a great question, Nicola. And your firm will have a preference. Your firm will tell you, and most firms are going to say, we're going to use exclusive right to sell. Uh, but if you are allowed to use exclusive agency agreement, then your firm will have that, how to handle this discussion with you. Yep. Again, sellers don't know this stuff. You know what I'm saying? So if you go to the seller and say, you want to do exclusive agency, exclusive right to sell. So I was going to say, huh? So that's why, you know, we, we, you know, we're the ones that kind of drive this a little bit, you know, and help educate the sellers as we go. Um, but that right to sell, that's all I've ever seen. Okay. Also in North Carolina, we have something called the North Carolina Protection Agreement. Y'all, this is protecting you. Specifically, this is protecting your commission. The North Carolina Protection Agreement is not an agency agreement. I'm not trying to attempt to create agency. Somebody that didn't hire me is offering to pay my commission. I think the most common time that we would use this agreement is when you're acting as a buyer's agent and your buyer becomes interested in a for sale by owner. We will see in our buyer's agency agreement, it says that I will always ask the seller to pay my commission first. And if they can't or won't, then the buyer has to. But I tell my buyer, I'm always going to go to the seller first. So you have a buyer that's interested in a for sale by owner. They say, I want to see it tomorrow afternoon. You say, great. You call the for sale by owner. You say, I have a buyer. We want to come out tomorrow. Bisbo says, great. We'll see you then. And you say, by the way, by the by, are you willing to cooperate with me? Are you willing to pay me? If my buyer buys, is the for sale by owner under any obligation to pay you? No, they're unrepresented. They're going at it on their own, right? We always ask if they say, yeah, 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 I'm going to pay you. Absolutely. No problem. My question to you is, are you going to take them at their word? Are you going to believe them? Please shake your head no. Absolutely not. How are you going to protect your commission? This is why we have this North Carolina Protection Agreement. There's actually the name of the form. It's the in practice on page 212. It's a mouthful. Unrepresented seller disclosure and fee agreement. That's the name of the form. So when the FISBO says, yes, I'm going to pay you, we're going to send them this unrepresented seller disclosure and fee agreement. And I'm also going to send the FISBO something else. Can anybody tell me what else I'm going to send this FISBO? Not just the protection agreement. What else do I need to go over with this FISBO? All y'all's mouths in there. Yes. Yes. Don't we need to do our working with real estate agent disclosure? Doesn't that FISBO need to know that I represent the buyer? Doesn't that FISBO need to know that I don't owe them confidentiality? So. Yes or no, I'll pay your commission. Either way, we need to do the disclosure with the FISBO so they know where we stand in this transaction. If they agree to pay me, send them the protection agreement. If they say, no, I'm not paying you, then your buyer has to. And we have this conversation. I'll show you this home tomorrow, but you need to understand the seller's not willing to pay me. So if you move forward, you're up. Guys, nobody is gonna look after your commission but you don't assume, make sure you got that covered. And if the FISBO is going to pay you, if the unrepresented party is going to pay you, we got a form for that. <clears throat> I 
there's a couple different types of listing services out there. Generally speaking, most firms are full service brokers, which means we'll offer you the full shebang. We'll market it, we'll put it in MLS, we'll advertise it, da da da. We got everything. We're starting to see, let's see, I'm sorry, what do you do if the buyer says, sorry, I don't want to pay you? If they're in a written agency agreement with me, they've already agreed to pay me. That conversation has happened. You with me? Right? Because we put them in writing and that's part of what that agreement says. If we're oral, I got to have a conversation with them now, don't I? Absolutely. And if the buyer says I'm not going to pay, I mean, it's up to you if you want to work for free or not. Guess not. Yeah. So, you know, we got to make sure. So anyway, most of us are full service brokers, but something that we're starting to see pop up, something that we're starting to see more common is a limited service listing broker. I need everybody to understand, first off, y'all don't say stuff like discount broker. That could quite easily be called group boycotting, anything negative about another company. So don't refer to them as a discount broker, or half a broker, you know, don't give the implication that they're doing anything wrong because they're not. In a limited service listing agreement, the firm represents the seller. The firm owes the seller old car. They're not limiting um, what they owe them. They're just limiting what they'll do for them. And usually with limited service listings, you have like a la carte pricing. It's like ordering off the dollar menu at Wendy's. You know, I want this, this, and this. If you want, you're listing an MLS, you're gonna pay X amount. If you want an open house, you're gonna pay X amount. They choose the services that they want. And that's what we mean by the limited service. Uh, somebody asked about a transaction. Is that my last example with the FISBO? I'm representing the buyer. So, I'm a buyer's agent. Okay, but you had said that we're, if you don't, if it's an oral agreement, are I'm you representing the buyer. Okay. If it's an oral agreement, I'm in an oral buyer agency agreement. Okay, but you're going to do it effectively for free. Right, because I'm going to get them in writing. Okay. Yeah. Now, if it's a buyer customer and they want to see you for sale by owner, I can't help them because nobody hired an agent in that scenario. That's that transaction broker. But, okay, I'm just referring to the comment that you had made. Did All I right. say something misleading? You had said, are you willing to work for free? And then go ahead, which it would imply you're working as a transaction facilitator. No, I can be in an agency agreement and not receive commission. Okay. If I don't hash it out, that's what we got to do. We got to hash it out in the agency agreement. If you put zero in there, you have an agreement to get paid zero as a buyer's agent. <laughs> you know, it's not filled in. We got to put that in because it's not price fixed. Remember, it's not determined. So we need to fill that in. Is that good? Does that? Yeah. So limited service listing. Again, you guys, we still owe the limited service companies still owe these um, sellers, old car. They're just limiting the services that we're going to provide. We're seeing these pop up everywhere. Um, I've done two of these. I've worked two of these as a buyer's agent. The first one I did, um, I, I mean, to this day, I have yet to have any communication with the listing agent. All the communication I had was directly with the seller. That wasn't part of the service that the listing firm was offering. My buyer actually found this house. I sent her open housing that Sunday because I was doing an open house myself. So I gave her a stack of my business cards and I said, go open housing. That's where she, I got out of my open house and she called me and said, I found the one, can we write it up? I was like, well, that was easy. She met the seller at the open house. The listing agent wasn't involved. It's a limited service. So they pretty much paid to put an MLS, put a combo box on the door. I was a little nervous at first, I'm not gonna lie, but come to find out this seller was an investor that does this 10, 12 times a year. They were probably a lot more proficient at it than others. You know what I'm saying? 
I wouldn't recommend this for somebody that only sells a house every 10 or 12 years, but somebody that does this on a regular basis, it's a great way for the seller to save some money. When we got in that transaction, when we got to closing, and they offered to pay me, by the way, they did offer an MLS to pay my commission. And when we got to closing and I looked at the figures, I had the commission that I expected to collect and the listing firm got like $600. So they were only collecting for what they did. And that's what the limited service listing company is. And now here we are, our multiple listing services. We have, I think I've heard 40 some across the state. I don't know them all. They're all different. They all have different rules. They all have different regulations. You and you affiliate with your firm, you will join whichever MLS your firm is a member of or whichever MLS is your firm is a member of. The biggest benefit of the MLS is the place for us to pull our listings. Remember last night we talked about inventory and a salesperson needs a product to sell. So by pulling our listings together in MLS, it allows me to share my listing with everybody else in the triad MLS, for example. It allows me to open it up to that many more buyers. Again, sellers want the exposure. They want their listing out there. They want the world to see it because that's their pool of buyers. Thousands of websites, feeds from the MLS. It is downright amazing to me. What's your favorite? Zillow, realtor.com, allentate.com, better homes and garden. I mean, what, where do you like to go to look at houses for sale? It all starts at the Triad MLS or whatever your MLS is. So we pull our listings together and we also offer corporate cooperation and compensation. Again, when my buyer wants to see 123 Main Street, I know when I'm on the phone, when I look it up in MLS, I know how much they're willing to pay me if I sell this property to this buyer or any buyer. You guys tell me all the time, day one, y'all tell me, I don't do math. I don't like math. Ooh, I don't like math. I tell you what, when it comes to doing your commission, y'all blow my mind. You pull that up in MLS, you talk it on the phone, you look at it and you says it offers X amount commission. Before you even get in your car to go show it, you've already figured out in your head how much you're gonna make when you sell 123 Main Street. Learn how to calculate your commission when you join your firm. So with the multiple listing services, I wanna get out of here just for one second. <clears throat> and if we look at the online learning system, again, if we look at the unit eight material, a um, couple things in here for you guys. Here's that slide we looked at a couple times. I just put it in here if there's anybody that needs to come back and see it again and again. We're gonna look at forms when we get back from break and we're gonna see the ings and the ers a little bit better. I also mentioned that I pulled that one slide out so you guys would have that. And that's how we know with our open listing, our exclusive agency, and then our exclusive right to sell. We'll look at our listing agreement when we come back. But I have in here a sample MLS input sheet for you guys, a listing data sheet. You're not gonna be tested specifically on this, but I do put it in here because I know sometimes it helps you guys to see some of the things that you're required to do, some of the things that you will need to do as a listing agent, if you were to put this in, understanding all MLSs are different, but this just gives us an idea. Everything you see in yellow is required, which means I can't submit the listing without that information. Everything else just helps describe the property. If you wanna add it, great. Uh, so we got our property information, where is it, subdivision, uh, zoning, um, our deed book and page, our tax information. This is all this research on the property that we're doing up front before we list it. Uh, other good stuff in here. Um, agency type. 
Remember we talked about whether or not you offer compensation to a buyer's agent or a subagent? We have to identify an MLS, who are we gonna pay? And if your firm isn't willing to cooperate or if your seller isn't willing to cooperate with a subagent, then you just wanna make sure that you check buyer agent only. We need to notify everybody, seller subagents are not welcome. And we can communicate with everybody that way in the MLS, showing information, house information. You know, these are the pages, like I was telling you guys, I print these out, all these check box. I print these out. If we look down here, square footage of every single room, we got like exterior features, interior features. I actually print this out and take it with me so I can walk around the house and go, yep, they got arched doorways, they got a hot tub. You see what I'm saying? So I know when I'm going to market the property what this home looks. I'm old school. Clipboard and a piece of paper still work just fine with me. Some of you are fancier and may want to pull it up on your phone. But, you know, the point is, is we got to make sure that we get this information so we can properly market and list the property flooring, what appliances are going to stay. I mean, oh, you know, the heating, everything in yellow, directions, how do we get there? Don't put see GPS. Y'all not know not everybody uses GPS, right? That's a pet peeve of mine. Not everybody has GPS. Not everybody uses it. So when you say GPS, you've limited that pool of buyers. All right, pet peeve over. Uh, you know, just various information. So again, I got this in here for you guys. You're not going to be tested on this, but I think it helps you better understand what you're going to need to gather and get together to list this property. So what are we looking for? And I'll tell you, the Real Estate Commission, if it goes down, they may ask to see your data sheet. They may ask to see where did you get that wrong information that you put in MLS. So it's a great documentation uh, about where you got, how you got that information. Questions on that, comments? Okay. Uh, I'm not gonna go back in real quick, but just to show you guys the next slide. Uh, when we come back from break, we're gonna go back to the online learning system and we're gonna look specifically at our exclusive right to sell listing agreement. All of our standard forms have some kind of form number. You don't need to know the numbers, but in time, the forms that you use most often, you'll know the numbers. They have like four or 500 forms available for us. So if you only use four, it may be helpful to know those numbers so you can find it. Um, but the one we're gonna look at when we get back from break is our exclusive right to sell listing agreement standard form 101. So let's go ahead and take 10. When we come back, we're gonna look at our form.
Way back. So as I mentioned, taking attendance, uh, where we're going now, we're gonna go and look at our agency agreement. I'm not gonna go through it word for word. I'm not gonna read it to you guys. Uh, we're gonna go through some of the more important points to have a conversation about it. If you guys will look with me real quick in your book on page 216. 216, let's get this flashing thing out of our eyes. 216 starts the conversation of our listing agreement, listing contract form. Uh, so you can see it talks about some of the different provisions on 216, 217, 218, 219, over, over to uh, 220. So again, what's in your book, what you're seeing 216 to 2, actually 21, are the more important provisions that we're going to look at in the agency agreement. The recommendation of your book is that you go through the provisions of the book with the listing agreement also in front of you. So you can kind of read, for example, about the agency disclosure on page 216, and then go find it in the agency agreement so you can see what it's ta actually talking about there. So use the two side by side. I have the current exclusive right to sell listing agreement for us. Um, and I got some highlights on it here for you guys. The syllabus says that, well, it said, the commission says, excuse me, that if it's in the syllabus, it's a good candidate for your exam. So what I have highlighted here for you is what's discussed in the syllabus. So I do recommend you guys look at the sections that are highlighted because they could be a good candidate for exams. This makes sense. You're welcome to read the whole thing. You're going to have to do it eventually anyway, but I don't want you using all your study time for things that you may not see on your test. So when you're looking at these, please just focus on the highlights. That's why they're there. So our exclusive right to sell listing agreement. A lot of the forms that we use come with guidelines. They provide us guidelines for completing. So if you need guidance on how to complete the forms, if your broker in charge isn't available, if your peers aren't around, if you're trying to fill this out at three o'clock in the morning and you need help, you always have the guidelines available. Your firm will provide all the forms for you. So you'll be able to see those. Um, this says exclusive right to sell listing agreement is entered into between, and we're gonna list the names of the sellers of the property and the firm. So we list the name of the sellers and we list the name of the firm, not the individual agent. Um, this blue note, probably about, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago, they added blue notes and red warnings in our forms meant to pop out meant to attract our eyes. So this is just talking about if you are gonna list in a state or if it's a business or an entity, it just kind of gives you a little bit more information. Most of these say call an attorney. We have, let me not skip that. Uh, seller represents at the effective date that they not or will not be a party to a listing agreement with another firm regarding this property, seller also represents that they received a copy of what? The working with real estate agent disclosure. Not that you are giving it to them now, but they've already received it. Guys, understand, the disclosure is the consumer form. We're now being hired by the client, aren't we? When we get to this point, we've passed the disclosure. So it's just another way um, for the seller to acknowledge that they received a copy. They represent that they've already received a copy of this. Term of the agreement tells us our effective date. How long is the agreement gonna be? When are we gonna market it? Um, we need to talk about, we have a couple of different options for when we're gonna market that we'll see. And then we also have the expiration date. All agency agreements have to have a definite expiration date. This agreement shall terminate at 11.59 p.m. on, and we're going to put in an actual date. 
How long are we going to have this agency agreement? Are we going to do it two months, six months, whatever? That's all firm's policy agreement between the seller. A lot of the times it's dictated by the market, how fast homes are selling right now. This is blank though, because it's negotiable. So you're not going to look at the seller and say, you're going to hire me for a year and a half. Are you good with that? Just like you're right. It's a conversation we have to have. We are entering into this together. So these points should be negotiable, keeping in mind your firm's policy. Ah, uh, yes, that was, that was one exception of when our uh, agency would continue. Absolutely. Yep. Then we have the property. We're going to describe the property. So I got a place for the address, city, county. It's North Carolina home form. So it's North Carolina home. Before we go on to page two, I just want to point out a couple of things here. Um, I am a member of the National Association of Realtors, so I'm allowed to rock the capital R. Only Realtors can rock that capital R. If you're not a member, you need to get your form somewhere else because they are the ones that provide, actually who provide your forms is the state level, which is the North Carolina Association of Realtors. So that's one huge member benefit. Again, your firm will tell you if they do or do not want you. Uh, we're indicating that we equal housing opportunity. We honor equal housing opportunity, uh, the form number if you need, and then the revised date. So we've got the most current form. Um, so we're talking about the property, street address, et cetera. And then we're gonna continue describing the property with the legal description. So what's the subdivision? What's the tax PIN number? What's the deed book and page? Again, all this research that we're doing to help get the listing ready. Fixtures and exclusions. Does it seem like so long ago we talked about fixtures? But really what it seems like forever ago. Remember fixtures? Uh, we need to have a conversation with the seller. This list of fixtures is the exact same list that also shows up in our offer to purchase and contract. If the seller's planning on taking any of these fixtures, we need to have a conversation about it now. Like if you're gonna take the, uh, I don't know, let's say you're gonna take the ceiling fan. All right, great, the seller can take it. I need to know, when are you gonna take it down? My preference would be for you to take it down and replace it before I list it, before I take pictures, before I allow a buyer in the front door. Once again, can I make anybody do anything? No. So if the seller says, no, I'm not taking that ceiling fan down till I move. All right. It now becomes my responsibility as the listing agent to let any interest in anybody know that when they buy this house, that ceiling fan is not going to be there. So we need to have this conversation about fixtures with the seller up front. <laughs> so many times I've been on listing appointments and I've, we've been discussing fixtures. And the sellers have said, okay, we'll look at this after, we'll look at this before we go to bed tonight. You know what? I'm a really patient person. I can sit here for three minutes for you to look at this list and tell me what you think you're going to take so we can have a conversation about it now. Does that make sense? Not just leave it to chance. We got to make sure we're on the same page with fixtures. If there's anything that they want to take, any fixtures they want to take, uh, then we need to list it here, anything that's not gonna convey. So we need to actually spell it out. Again, listing agents, when the offer comes in, you'll need to make sure that those fixtures are excluded. You'll need to make sure that the buyer recognizes that they're not gonna get that ceiling fan when they buy that house. So we need to make sure we look at that in our offer to purchase and contract. If they do take any fixtures, it says right here that they're gonna repair any damages caused by the removal of any of the items excluded above. So they just can't rip the ceiling fan out of the ceiling and leave a big hole, right? They got to do something to repair that, maybe replace it with something. That's what we're having a conversation about. Great, you're taking the ceiling fan down. What you going to do with that part of the ceiling? Then we got a place for personal property. Remember when we talked about personal property, is there anything you're willing to leave? Keep in mind, just because the seller's willing to leave it, may not necessarily mean that the buyer wants it. All we're saying here is that the seller's willing to leave it. If the buyer wants it, 
they have it. We're just identifying these items. We're going to see pretty much for the fixtures and the personal property, the exact same verbiage when we look at our contract. So we're just having these conversations up front with the seller. Then we got to discuss the listing price. Seller lists the property at a price of on the following terms. How does the seller want their offer? Do they just want to deal with cash buyers? Um, was the home qualify for an FHA loan or a VA loan? Is it conventional? What are the seller's options here? We're going to talk about the different loan types, FHA, VA, USDA, conventional, all that, uh, when we get into our financing units. So we'll have discussions about 14 and 15 are our financing units. We need to have this form complete before we ask the seller to sign. We need to have everything filled out before we have the seller sign. Make sense? Everybody good with that? The Real Estate Commission specifically says that we must have the price decided. We can never ask the seller to sign a listing agreement without, don't put TBD in there. We've got to have the price agreed on and decided. We'll talk a little bit um, how we can help the seller determine that list price, come to this acceptable price, make sure we're all on the same page. But this one absolutely cannot be blank, cannot be anything but the exact amount that we're gonna list the home for before we ask the seller to sell it. Then we come down and talk about our money. What does the firm expect to collect? Firm's compensation. Remember, this is an employment contract. You're hired to do a job. We need to agree on how much I expect to get paid. So seller agrees to pay the firm, the listing firm, a total fee of whatever percent or the flat fee. We go on to explain the seller when we earn our commission, when we've actually earned the fee. We bring that ready, willing, and able buyer, for example. There's something called a protection period, not to be confused with the protection agreement that we just talked about. Look with me real quick. This is when real estate gets fun. Look with me onto page 218. 218 talks about the protection period. Let's have some fun. The protection period could also be known as the extender clause, which could also be known as the override clause. I actually have three words that mean the same thing. Isn't that fun? The agency agreement <laughs> specifically says protection period. This is what the protection period is. Um, if the circumstances set out above have not occurred within X amount of days, again, how many days? It's all negotiable. Within X amount of days after the expiration date, if the seller sells within those amount of days after the expiration date, the listing firm may still be entitled to a commission. So if my agency agreement expires today, I've been marketing your home for six months and my agency agreement expires today and a buyer brings an offer tomorrow, doesn't it stand a reason that that buyer learned about the property because of my marketing? I mean, I marketed up until 1159 last night. So there's a good chance that that buyer learned about that property because of my marketing. There are two caveats to this. First off, this isn't just any old buyer that shows up. I have to provide names to this seller of buyers that I think are interested. I have to know that there's somebody out there interested. The second caveat, if the seller lists with another firm, I'm out because they're now in an agency agreement with that other firm. That other firm is now owed commission. But if you put X amount of days in here and you tell the seller, I know for the fact that the Joneses are considering this, they're thinking really hard about it. If the Joneses make an offer within X amount of day and they close, I may still be entitled to a commission. And that kind of cool. Again, it's about protecting the firm, protecting their commission. There's also been cases where sellers 
somehow, I don't know how, but somehow sellers have found out that buyers are going to make an offer and they've reached out to the buyer and they've said, my agency agreement expires tomorrow. Why don't you bring me that offer on Friday? So they know about, I don't know how they know, but somehow that's happened. And it's a way for us to help protect ourselves and our commission. If we've been the ones marketing and advertising this property for the last however many years. Again, though, there's two caveats. So protection period, extender clause, override clause. Then we talk about cooperation with other forms. So I'm gonna go back up for one second. We've already discussed how much the listing firm expects to collect when they've done their job. How much is the listing firm gonna get the seller? The seller pays the listing firm and then the listing firm shares their commission with whomever's bringing the buyer. So now we have to list how, how much of that commission we're gonna share. And I have, for our purposes, two boxes here. Am I gonna cooperate with a seller sub agent? Or are we gonna cooperate with buyer's agents or both? Are we willing to pay a seller sub agent? If so, how much? How much are we gonna pay that buyer's agent? This is how we know that split. The seller pays the listing firm, the listing firm shares their commission with whomever brings the buyer. We're all in agreement to this going in, firm and seller are in agreement to it going in. Then we get into the firm's duties. These agency agreements are a two-way street. Both parties have duties and responsibilities to each other. And we need to spell out what those duties and responsibilities are. So first off, we have the firm's duties. What's the firm's biggest responsibility? We're gonna do what we can to find you a buyer. That's why you hired me, right? Um, disclosure material facts of the offer, disclosure material facts, other professional services, am I gonna uh, recommend if you want a landscaper or a painter, am I going to recommend anybody that I may know, uh, have had experience with? I have a duty to provide the serve to the listing service, the MLS. I have a duty because I'm a member of the MLS, I have to run my listings through the MLS. I have that duty as part of my membership. Here's our non discrimination clause. Uh, remember, the non-discrimination clause is required in all written agency agreements. Um, the agent, the firm shall conduct all brokerage activities in regard to this agreement without respect to the race, color, religion, sex, national origin, handicap, or familiar status of any property or prospective property. Further, realtors have an ethical duty to conduct such activities without respect to the sexual orientation or gender identity of any party or prospective party. This non-discrimination clause is required in all of our agency agreements. We're gonna talk about these protected classes, what all these mean, uh, what this means to us when we get to unit 19, some more to come. Then we're gonna discuss how we're gonna market the property. Uh, when do we start marketing the property? It's awfully hard to sign an agency agreement and put it on the market all on the same day. Cause I gotta get listing data together. I gotta get pictures. I gotta get measurements, right? Like I got some work to do. So there's a difference in when we sign the agency agreement and when we're actually gonna market it. So what we're agreeing to now is when are we gonna market it? You know, we signed this today. You know, I gotta line up my guys, my paint, not my painter, but my photographer and my measurer, you know, all those guys to come over. So when are we, or I'm going to do it myself, but when are we actually going to market the property? And then who we're going to market it to? Are we going to market it to the public? Are we going to put it in MLS and make it available to everybody? Or I'll come back up in just a second. Are we just going to keep it in-house? Are we not going to market to everybody? We're just going to have an office exclusive. Office exclusive means I can only market or talk about it within our firm's four walls. It's to, the, not even the firm, 
in our office's four walls. So, you know, again, various reasons. But if we are going to market publicly, then we're going to go on to say, what are we going to do? Are we going to put signs in the yard? Are we going to do an open house? Are we going to advertise other than the internet? Or are we going to do internet advertising? Office exclusive, obviously the seller needs to understand they're limiting their pool of buyers, right? You just went from opening it up to the whole world to just the people. So it's a conversation we need to have, make sure we're on the same board, same page. Are we gonna put a lockbox on the property they do or do not authorize? Seller's got some acknowledgements. It's not highlighted, it's not on the syllabus. You guys are welcome to read this, just some things that the seller acknowledges. I mean, a lot of this is saying, like, for example, I have zero, and I mean zero control over Zillow. So if there's incorrect information out there on Zillow, I mean, I'll try to get it fixed. But Zillow, for example, they do their own thing. They got a mind of their own. So I don't have control of the internet. And that would be an example of something that the seller would want to acknowledge. I think somebody asked about this the other day, a big red warning, again, not highlighted, but we've talked about it. Uh, maybe a crime under federal and state laws to listen to or record an oral communication through the use of any electronic, mechanical, or other device without the consent of a party to that communication. If there is video audio surveillance, sellers advise that no audio surveillance device may be turned on during showings and that the placement of any video surveillances should not violate a visitor's reasonable expectation of privacy. No cameras in the bathrooms, right? Have them in the living room, the main rooms, the front door, the front porch, but we can't have audio without consent. So we address that in our agency agreement, listing agreement. We address it in our buyer's agency agreement too. Earnest money, we're going to talk all about earnest money in unit 10, so I'm not going to say too much about this right now because we're getting there, uh, but whether or not the firm does or does not maintain a trust account, whether or not the firm does or does not hold earnest money deposit is what we're discussing here with the sellers. Again, we'll talk about that, what it means, what it looks like, da, da, da. unit 10. Sellers got to make some representations to the firm, how long they've owned the property, are they facing bankruptcy? Is there a mobile home on the property? Are they in an owner's association? If so, who is the owner's association? They need to represent whether or not they're in a flood hazard. They are, are not located in the flood hazard. They do or do not have to pay Insurance, flood insurance. Here's our synthetic stucco, whether or not it's been previously clad in synthetic stucco. Uh, is there a termite bond? And then we ask the seller about their liens. Is there a deed of trust on the property? If so, what's the approximate balance? I don't need a penny, down to the penny, but I need an idea to make sure that the seller's not underwater. Um, so we have a place here for the first deed. There's the second deed. There's the third deed. If you have more than that, then we add an additional piece of paper with additional deeds. So we got to get the seller to give us their balances. Again, we're trying to help them determine when you sell this house, this is how much I think you're going to get. But I can't help them determine that if I don't know what their outstanding liens are. So we're getting awfully deep and awfully personal very early in our relationship, aren't we? but it's protecting me, it's also protecting the seller to get this information. Uh, is there currently a lease on the property? Do we have an uh, uh, existing lease and a tenant in place? Special assessments, maybe from the government or the HOA, if we're in an HOA, are there any special assessments? Fuel tanks on the property are or are not in use. You own it, you lease it. It's above ground, below ground. It's got oil, propane, gasoline, et cetera. All the information, who refills it, who's responsible for coming out and refilling it. 
Got a place for tank one and tank two, if they have more than one. And then here are the seller's duties to the firm. So we talked about the firm's duties to the seller. So now we got the seller's duties to the firm. Biggest duty that the seller owes the firm other than commission is to cooperate with the firm in the marketing and sale of the property. Uh, the seller has a couple of disclosures that they need to provide, uh, which we will talk about. Residential property disclosure, we're getting there. The mineral and oil and gas rights, we're talking about that. Lead-based paint addendum, if it was built prior to what year? 1978. You only need to know that for your test. Once you get your license, it's right here for you. Help you remember. So various disclosures that the seller has to provide. Uh, the seller has a duty to keep working in existing utilities on to allow for showings. It's kind of hard to see a home when it's dark out. It's kind of hard for the home inspector to inspect if they don't have power. So the seller has a duty to keep existing utilities on throughout closing. They're gonna help us provide, here's our restrictive covenants, bylaws if it's in an HOA, owner's association documents. They're gonna help provide that to us so we can share it with a buyer if they're interested or if the property they're interested in has an HOA, I should say. Seller is authorizing the attorney to release their title insurance policy. Once they sell the home, then that title insurance policy cancels and the buyer or the new owner now gets their own policy. Uh, owners association to release their forms. Seller's going to deliver a general warranty deed, given all those covenants and warranties to the new owner. The grantee. Photographs and other materials. The firm's telling the seller when I come in and take pictures, those pictures are my property. Even though they're pictures of your home, those pictures are my property. So if I don't sell your home and you list with somebody else, that somebody else has to come take their own pictures. They can't take mine to list. Does that make sense? Because that's my property. So we're making sure we understand that. Here is dual agency as it's explained to the seller. Um, I really do. If y'all don't look at anything else, I see you guys glossing over. And I understand that forms aren't the most exciting part about real estate. But do y'all know what a big part about real estate is? Forms. So like it or not, here we are. If you haven't read dual agency yet, I do suggest you do this because this is dual agency, the firm explaining dual agency to the seller. So it's a good way uh, for you guys to help. Here's the role as a dual agent, the seller's role if we go into dual agency and then it explains designated dual agency. And then we have, let me see if I can't get this just right. Okay. Then we have authorization or direction for dual agency. So the seller authorizes the firm to act as a dual agent, representing both the seller and the buyer. Seller may or may not want one agent, the individual agent representing both. So the seller may say, I'm okay with dual, but I want the buyer to have a different agent in the firm. They may not want the one doing both. If we have yes to dual, if the seller's initial yes to dual, then we may have the opportunity to offer, if the firm offers designated dual agency, um, also initial if firm offers designated and seller authorizes designated dual agency. So if we're gonna do designated, we can put it here. So seller either authorizes the firm to act as a dual agent or Seller wants exclusive representation and they do not authorize dual agency. Julie, yeah. under dual agency, you've got that does and does not authorize the same individual. Mm -hmm. You don't authorize the same individual to represent both the seller and the buyer. Isn't that the definition of designated? Well, designated is, remember designated, you're kicking agents off the wall now, right? We haven't made it to designated yet. We're just saying if we remain in dual, if we never become designated and we remain in dual, 
is the seller okay with one agent being the dual agent? Okay, but if he's not, you've got to kick somebody off the wall. You don't have to. Not all firms offer designated. It's not always an option. Okay. So if you don't kick anybody off the wall, we're all still straddling the wall in dual agency. Uh, so dual, yes or no? It's pretty clear. Again, you guys, we're having these conversations. Remember what we know about dual agency. Intentionally created with informed written consent. Do not look at a seller and say, okay, we're going to do dual. I need you to sign here and here. That's not how you intentionally create it with informed written consent. We have the conversation. How do we have the conversation? We use the forms to help us out. We use the forms to help us put words in our mouth. Termination, breach, mediation, attorney's fees. If it goes down and we got to take somebody to court, here's that boilerplate stuff in contracts about how we're going to handle that. I think most contracts prefer hashing this out mediation uh, as opposed to, you know, full-blown trial. Um, so that's just what that's talking about there. Attorney's fees, who's responsible for that? Wire fraud. Wire fraud's gotten really big, really fast in real estate. Um, monies are being intercepted that are meant to go to or from the attorney's office. So either the buyer has to bring money to closing or the seller is going to get money for closing. And when we do these electronically, they're susceptible to wire fraud. So I think one of the very best things we can do to protect our clients is to look them in the eyeball and tell them that I will never email you wire transfer instructions. Never. And then stick to that. Because they need to know if they get an email from you with wire transfer instructions, you've been hacked. And those wire transfer instructions are coming from the hackers that are encouraging them to send their money to that offshore overseas account that they're never, ever going to see again. To get those wire transfer instructions, what this goes on to say is that the seller needs to go old school and call the closing attorney at a number that they independently obtained. Don't call them at a number from an email because what if you were hacked, right? So go to Google, look the number up and call, have the seller do this um, for their wire transfer instructions. So if they want, the attorney can transfer their proceeds to them after closing. We see the same thing in our buyer's agency agreement. We see the same thing in our offer to purchase and contract. So by the time they're done with us, we've had two conversations. Um, it's gotten that big that fast. So um, more to come on that as you guys get further, obviously, how we can protect. But this is a really good place to start with this wire fraud warning. If you want to look at that. And then we got some signatures. So I got a place, I have places for two sellers to sign, uh, print their name, sign and date it, any contact information. If you have more than two sellers, we have something called an additional signature addendum. So if you have more than two sellers, you can add the additional signature addendum. I think there's eight places for signatures on that. So now you got 10 sellers signing it. If you need more than 10, you add another additional signatures addendum. You need everybody to sign this listing agreement that has got to show up on closing day to sign that deed to convey it. So everybody on the deed and their spouses, because we need to make sure that everybody's on the same page from day one. Your seller might be an entity seller. Is it a business or, co or a, a co corporation? So we have that place here for them. And then we're going to list the firm. Print the real estate firm name, firm license number and phone, the office address. But it's actually going to be signed by the individual agent with their license number. And then their contact information. 
individual agent signature. We get to sign it on behalf of our firm. The firm doesn't sign this, but we get to sign it on their behalf, which is why, because we're the ones signing it. So that's why our license number is required. That is the short and sweet of our exclusive right to sell listing agreement. I'm aware of that. We went through it fast. I get it. Again, I don't think it's necessary for you guys to sit down and read this whole thing right now. I want you to focus on getting through these exams, right? Let's do one thing at a time. So that's why I've highlighted to help you guys draw your attention to what to focus on now. Eventually you will get to read the whole thing because one day you're going to be sitting in front of a seller going it over with them, getting them to complete it. So we need to be familiar with it, but please don't try to, to be familiar with it now. Just focus on what you need for your test. We'll go through this in more detail in post-licensing. Your firm will go through it with you in detail. You will eventually learn this thing well. What questions do I have? Agent uh, listing agreement. What comments do I have? Good stuff, huh? Somebody says, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I didn't give you time to read it. And I'm aware of that because I don't have time to let you, I, I'm not going to read it to you. I mean, you're not going to like that. I got somebody going to sleep anyway. If I start reading this thing to you guys, you know, the surefire way to get me to take a nap, read something to me, right? So that's on you guys, right? And that's where we say you go through it. You look at the highlights. I highlighted it for a reason. So you look at what's highlighted and then you got those pages in your book. Uh, again, 216 to 221 that talk more about more of those important provisions. All right, my time to ask you guys a question. Tell me in a private chat. Everybody ready? Private chat, and I need to hear from everybody. A, B, C, or D. Everybody in? So all of the following are true. Um, all of the following are true of a listing agreement under North Carolina Real Estate Commission rules, except did it mention the penalties and the remedies? Let's just forget about the listing agreement for a second. Basic contract law says any agreement between two parties has to discuss the remedies, the penalties. We're going into this as an agreement and contract law says we've got to talk about what if one of us doesn't do what we promised to do. So it has to mention the penalties and the remedies. It's got to have a definite termination date. We cannot have a listing agreement that goes on and on and on indefinitely. We have to have a definite end date, um, include a guarantee that the property will sell, 
goodness, that word guarantee makes me very nervous. I don't have a crystal ball, um, unfortunately. I don't have the powers to look into the future and promise you that your house will sell. Um, it must be in writing to entitle the listing firm to collect the commission. The way you're gonna get paid is if it's in writing. So what we were looking at here, I cannot give a guarantee. I can promise you that I will do everything in my power. I will promise you that I will do everything that I can, but I can't give you that guarantee. And in no way in that listing agreement did it say, I promise, I had a seller actually, we were at the listing appointment. He looked me in the eye and said, can you promise me that you'll sell me my home? And one thing I've learned in life, especially since I've been in sales, is that sometimes it's okay to pause and think for a couple seconds before you just blurt an answer out. So I paused and I thought, and I looked him back in the eye and I said, no, sir, I cannot. What I can do is tell you, I will try, I will do everything I can, but I'm not making promises that I don't know that I can keep. Does that make sense? Y'all be very, very careful when they want guarantees and promises. Make sure you can do it. Questions on this? <clears throat> okay, so picking back up on page 221, we're going to talk a little bit about how we can determine square footage. When we are determining square footage, what we are looking for is heated living area. Uh, could be total heated square footage, could be total heated living square footage. Not all space under the roof is going to qualify for heated living area criteria. Not all space under the roof is going to qualify for total heated square footage. In order for me to count it in my total heated living area, I must have these three things. The space has to be adequately heated by a permanently installed heating system. You can't put a space heater in a room and say it's being heated. It's gotta be a permanently installed heating system. And everybody please note, that says heat, doesn't it? Does that say anything about air conditioning? That says heat. Y'all, AC is a luxury. It's not required. So we have to have heat. It's got to be finished to generally accepted level of construction. I have got to have finished floors, ceilings, and walls. If we're looking at studs, if we're looking at plywood or pl uh, 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 plyboard, I can't count it in my total heat of living area. It's got to be finished. The ceiling height. To qualify, the ceiling height needs to be at least seven feet tall. You get some older homes. We were a lot shorter 100 years ago, weren't we? You get some older homes, you may not be able to qualify it. The ceiling height may not be seven feet. If the ceiling is sloped, so think of like a bonus room in an attic, for example. If the attic is finished and it's sloped, then you can have the slope at least five feet. And I got another resource for you guys too, so just bear with me. The third thing that's required in order for me to count it is it's got to be directly accessible from other heated living space. Like I need to be able to go from heated finished space from room to room to room. If I have to go through an unfinished or an unheated room, if it doesn't directly connect, it's not directly accessible, then I can't count what is not directly accessible. Let's say, for example, you have a finished room over the garage or a frog. Finished room over garage. Um, if we can make an acronym out of it, we will. So you have a frog. And in order to get to the frog, you have to walk through the unfinished, unheated garage. So to get to the stairs, you have to walk through the unheated, unfinished garage. I can't count the frog in my total heated living area. 
I can advertise the heck out of the frog. I can say there's an additional finish room over garage of, you know, 450 feet. But because it's not directly accessible, I can't count it in my total heated living area. It must meet all three of these. Now, about this time of the class, I start getting a bunch of questions. I have a cousin that has a space in their house and it looks like this. Can they count it? I don't know. I've not seen your cousin's house. I don't know the space. If you can look at that space and ask, is it heated? Is it finished? And is it directly accessible? Then yes, your cousin can count that. It's hard for me to answer all those questions if I can't see it. We must have these three things in order to count it in our total key to living area. Again, if you have that finished room over the garage, if the stairs are accessible, I can't count it. If you have to walk through a breezeway, for example, to get to an additional room or a bonus room, you're not gonna be able to count it unless the breezeway is adequately heated and finished. I think a general rule of thumb, as long as you walk from room to room to room and you don't get cold, <laughs> you can count it. When it comes to square foot, square footage is not a material fact in North Carolina. It's not a material fact. The commission does not require us to disclose the total square footage. However, if we do, we are responsible for it. Some MLSs require it. The commission doesn't require it. Some MLSs may. Remember where your test is coming from. Your test is not coming from the triad MLS. Your test is coming from the commission. So it's not a material fact. If you do report it, you're responsible for reporting it accurately. We cannot rely on tax records. Those things are very rarely accurate. Builders blueprints or previous MLS sheets. If somebody else previously listed it before you, that is their work. You can't go in and take their work. You can't go in and take their pictures. Um, for the most part, buyer's agents or those working with buyers should be able to rely on the square footage listed in the MLS. But if your little red flag goes up, we have a duty to help our buyer verify that. So I don't, I have no idea, but let's just say this room is 400 square feet. I just made a number up. If I look at this room, I should be able to say, yeah, okay, this is 400 square feet. If the MLS says 420, I don't think the average eye can tell the difference in being 20 square feet off. I think that'd be really hard for the average eye. However, if this room is advertised as 700 square feet, I should have a little red flag go up. So if you have ever any reason to question it, or if your buyer questions it, I keep my tape measure in my trunk. It's ready to go. Actually, when I got into sales, like Santa brought me a new toy, and it's a, um, a laser measure. So I hold it up to the wall. And I point it to the other wall and I hit the button and it tells me how many feet and inches. Thanks, Santa. That thing is in my trunk. It's ready to go. So if a buyer says, is this room really? And I can do the length times the width. Probably takes me longer to run out to my car to get it than it does to actually help my buyer verify that space. So if there's any questions, Generally speaking, again, most MLSs just require the total heated square footage. They do give us space to put the room dimensions. So if you want to do each room, the kitchen, you know, the living room. Um, I think generally speaking, sellers like it. It helps them describe the property. Um, buyers like that. They want to know how big the rooms are, how big is the bedroom, the kitchen. You know, it might help them decide what they see or don't want to see. Again, bottom line, the commission doesn't consider square footage a material fact. You guys have two choices. You either go out and measure your listings yourself, 
go out and measure them on your own, or you hire somebody to do it for you. And that person that you're hiring to do it for you has got to have more experience than you. So we're talking about an experienced agent, maybe an appraiser. You cannot hire the 16 year old down the street to go measure your listing. And if you hire somebody else to do it for you, you are still responsible for it. So you want to make sure that the person that you hire knows what they're doing because ultimately it's your listing and that responsibility is on you. I probably, of all the agents I know right now, I probably literally could divide them half and half. Half go measure their own listings every single time, half hire somebody else. No wrong way. I got a, a little measuring video. We'll start with that tomorrow night. Um, kind of gives us some basics, talks about a few more things. Something else just to kind of be aware of, area that's considered above grade or below grade. So this isn't so much for us. We don't care so much about this as the appraiser does. And while you and I are not an appraiser yet, or not going to appraisal school, uh, we do need to have this basic understanding. The appraiser is probably gonna put more value or less value on below grade. Below grade is when any one of the four sides touch earth. So above grade, nothing's touching earth. I don't know how well you can see this picture, but you can see down here, there's like a basement that comes out and this patty, you guys see this? This whole side touches earth. And because this whole side touches earth, it's considered below grade. Most appraisers are going to put less value on the basement, on the below grade. Again, that's not so much for us, but we need to understand the difference. It you know, may help us help the seller determine that pricing. Generally, when we measure, let's just pretend this is our house. And then we have, no, that's not what I want. And then we have our garage. So this is the house and this is the garage. Generally speaking, to get the total heated square footage, we generally start outside. So when we start outside, we're gonna measure from corner to corner to corner, corner to corner to corner, right? We're gonna go around the outside and measure. Once we measure outside, then we're gonna go in and deduct what doesn't count. So the garage generally isn't gonna fit heated or finished. So we're not gonna be able to include the garage. So generally speaking, we start outside and then go in to get the room dimensions and to deduct something that um, wouldn't count, like the garage, for example, any space that wouldn't count. Uh, do firms have an in-house appraiser? Nope, to aid, to aid newbies in determining value. We're gonna talk about that in unit 17. And to answer that real quick, I'm not allowed to determine value because I'm not an appraiser. So what I do and what the appraiser does is similar-ish, but because they're the appraiser, they're the ones that get determined value. I don't get to say words like value because I'm not a licensed appraiser. So they don't have in-house appraisers. However, they do have training. Uh, we're gonna talk about pulling comps. We're gonna talk about how we can help the seller determine what their home will sell for. So there are some things we can do. Unit 17 is our appraiser's unit. So real quick, again, I got a video. I'll show you guys that tomorrow. Real quick before we go, please turn with me to page 743 in your book, 743. 743 is Appendix C, and this is the Residential Square Footage Guidelines. Now in the real world, you'll get this nice little pretty glossary brochure 
but for the time being, you have Appendix C in your textbook. Let's go ahead and call Appendix C your measuring Bible. Everything you ever wanted to know about measuring is Appendix C. For your test, pages 744 and 745 is basically what we just talked about for your test. 744 and 745. So it's talking about the little gray box there, talking about below grade and above grade. There's our living area criteria that it's got to be heated. It's got to be finished. Uh, it talks about the ceiling being seven feet. It's got to be directly accessible. Seven forty-five gets into a little bit more specifics. Like, does the attic count? Well, it depends. Does the basement count? There's that bay window with our trapezoid. Does that count? Um, but the bonus room. So, just some more specifics. When we look at that video tomorrow night, uh, we're going to see a lot of these specifics addressed. A lot of these things measured. We're going to see them measuring the outside. Uh, we're going to put this conversation into the visual, into the video. Um, I think there's a little bit more in the video than what you need to know, but it'll help get us started. The rest of Appendix C is good stuff, 746 and on, and we'll, you know, we'll cover this in post-licensing. You guys will cover this with your firm. Again, they're not just gonna hand you a license and say, okie doke, go measure a house, right? That's why we have, support and VIX and post-licensing to help give you tools and the tools that you need to learn this stuff. So this isn't like you're gonna have to go measure a house as soon as you get your license. Your BIC will help you through this process. Page 750, we start looking at specific floor plans. So it gets into specifics about measuring a one story with a basement. Um, a two-story with an open foyer, a two-story with a bonus room. Again, just kind of little worksheets to help us learn how to measure some of these various spaces. For your test in Appendix C, just focus on 744 and 745. Once you get your license, then you can worry about 746 and on. Fair? All right. We're going to end here tonight. I think it's 8.30 on the dot. So thank you guys. Um, again, we'll come in tomorrow. We're going to watch a video on measuring. Be a good way to kind of revisit this. And then we keep going through unit eight. We very well may get to the math tomorrow night. So bring your calculators. That's all I got. Y'all have a good night.